And today, our theme is peace. So all I want for Christmas is peace. This second Sunday in Advent, we traditionally focus on peace. As we prepare for welcoming Jesus, the Prince of Peace, wouldn't it be nice to have a little bit of Advent peace in your house? With all the violence that's happening around the globe each day, wouldn't it be great to have a little peace in our world? Deep down inside, I think almost all of us long for peace within our families, within our nation, within every nation. The prophet Isaiah felt the same way. He had the same longings for peace that we do. The year was 700 BCE. The Jews had been fighting for 40 years. First, they fought the Assyrians, and then the Egyptians, then the Assyrians again, and then the Egyptians again. All their children had grown up with a spear in one hand and a sword in the other. From the time a child was three years old, they were training for war. Just like in parts of our world these days. Can you imagine being a child these days in Palestine or in regions of Nigeria that Boko Haram has taken over? The prophet Isaiah was tired of four decades of killing. He was tired of children being trained for war. He was tired of mothers and fathers and sons and daughters fighting with each other. He longed for peace because just like we do, we lived in a world at war. Isaiah had read the book of Genesis and he knew that when humans were created by God, it wasn't God's intention for us to hurt each other. It wasn't God's intention for parents and children, police and protesters, Arabs and Israelis, Muslims and Christians to be at war with each other. We were made for peace. Isaiah longed for peace and he dreamed of peace and he wrote down some of his beautiful dreams, which are some of the most memorable words in scripture. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation. Neither will they learn war anymore. Isaiah had visions of peace and he wrote about peace, but for another 700 years, the people continued to fight with each other until the Prince of Peace came. But even after Jesus came, the fighting continued. Different armies, different enemies, same result death, captivity, turmoil and trouble, no peace. The context for the passages we heard this morning from Isaiah is like our own. Peace seems hard to come by, and when it shows up, it seems fleeting at best. What are we supposed to do in unpeaceful, anxious-making times like these? One thing we can do is to slow down, to assess, because most of life's troubles aren't eradicated with rapid response. When we encounter troubled times in life, when we feel a lack of peace in ourselves, times like that invite our reflection, perseverance and endurance. The Reverend Professor Peter Gomes, Professor of Christian Morals, and minister of Harvard's Memorial Church for 35 years, was one of America's most prominent preachers and spiritual voices against intolerance. He once said he was living proof that God has an ironic sense of humor because he was a black Baptist gay man working at Harvard. He delivered a sermon to the Harvard community during troubled times in our country on Sunday, September 23rd, 2001, two weeks after 9-11. He preached, because we've been nice to God, our thinking goes, then God should be nice to us. God should somehow take note of it 
mark it down in the book and spare us any trouble, tribulation, turmoil, or difficulty. But we all know God doesn't spare us from troubles in life. Even the most casual reading of the scriptures tells us God strengthens us for turmoil. It is a shabby faith that suggests that God is to do all the heavy lifting and that you and I are to do none. We can also look a little closer to home than an Ivy League university for inner strength and peace in the midst of outer turmoil. We can look to the witness of scripture. Think of St. Paul, who was a Jew and a Christian. He speaks from the experience of a frustrated but not defeated believer. He doesn't write a how to be leaders and win motivational seminar sort of stuff that you can buy online. No, Paul writes out of failure and frustration and conflict, but never out of despair. If we want to read something useful during trying times like these, read Paul's letters in scripture. Read them to understand that we aren't the first people in the world ever to face a world sorely lacking in peace, a world filled with sorrow and frustration and terror. In Paul's letters, we find a record of coping that isn't just coping, but overcoming. So if you're feeling overwhelmed by what's going on around you, but don't want to get drowned by the despair that surrounds us, Go back to the one Paul writes about, the one who fulfills Isaiah's prophecy, the Prince of Peace. Only the love of Jesus Christ can save us and our world. Only the love of Jesus can bring us lasting peace. How will you manage when trouble comes? How will you cope with frustration and fear anxiety and failure. Those are no longer abstract theoretical questions in our world today. People are looking for strength, looking for inner peace that exists despite of life's troubles. Both Isaiah and St. Paul and all the writers in between remind us of one profound truth, that God is to be found where God is most needed in trouble, in sorrow, in sickness, and even in death. The Psalms make this point over and over, like Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. In years of ministry, I've noticed an interesting phenomenon in folks who are going through extreme challenges and troubles in their lives. Some of them come completely unraveled. Others manage to cope. But there's another group who seems to have an amazing peace in the midst of whatever it is they're going through. How can that be? It's not that their life situation doesn't matter or that they've become completely unhinged in their despair. That's not it. Their life matters a lot. They care deeply about their their relationships, their work. They've tapped into what Paul is talking about when he wrote to the church in Philippi. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's not peace in the absence of trouble. In the very middle of them, peace shows up and hangs around. They seem to be able to push through the worry and anxiety and lean into trust and faith. Time and time again, we see Jesus working with our anxiety, our fears, our worry, with the fragility of our humanity. Do you know that the first word that Jesus spoke when he visited the disciples in that locked upper room after the resurrection, when they were scared silly, afraid that they'd be the next ones to get it. Jesus showed up and said, peace. Peace be with you. 
He invited them to trust them and to take his peace for their own. We're also invited to let go of something that's toxic and harmful, that anxiety, that fear, and take on something else, God's peace. To let go of the worry and take on faith and trust in the love of God. When Jesus was getting ready to leave the disciples, he talked about peace again. He said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Inner peace like that can only be given to us by Christ. The world can't offer us anything like that, not anything that lasts anyway. That kind of peace is Christ gives to us, to any of us, to all of us. Freedom from fear and worry, that clutching anxiety that causes us to lose our breath. Jesus offers to exchange that for deep security of knowing that we're loved by God, that God is with us no matter what, that God has our backs every moment of our lives, in sickness and in health, in joy and in sorrow, in bad times and good ones. There's an invitation there for us to let Christ's peace rule in our hearts. Could it be that letting the peace of Christ rule in our hearts means simply not waiting out our troubles or enduring them, waiting until peace finally dawns on the horizon, but in giving, in tending to others, in working for peace, in lighting a candle, in the midst of darkness. As I prayed for the families affected by the horrible school shooting in Michigan last Tuesday, I remembered a YouTube video that I'd seen of a father's uplifting talk with his six-year-old son at the Paris Vigil for Victims in November 2015. It was an interview by a Paris newspaper reporter where people were laying flowers and lighting candles to honor the 129 people killed in terrorist attacks. In the video, the reporter asked preschooler Brandon Lee if he understood what had happened. Six-year-old Brandon told the reporter that the attacks the previous Friday were conducted by bad guys who were not very nice. He then expressed fear that his family would have to move. Although his father, Angel Lee, reassured him, oh, don't worry, we don't need to move out. France is our home, the father told his son. Brandon said quickly, but there's bad guys, Daddy. Yes, but there's bad guys, everyone, where, his father replied. They have guns. They can shoot us because they're really, really mean, Daddy. Putting his arm around his small son, the father referred to the crowd at the square and said, it's okay. They might have guns, but we have flowers. Brandon wasn't easily persuaded, but flowers don't do anything. Therefore, therefore, of course they do, his father said. Look, everyone is putting flowers. It's to fight against guns, the father explained. It's to protect? The son asked. Exactly. And the candles too? The boy asked. His father replied, they're to remember the people who were gone yesterday. The son said, the flowers and the candles are here to protect us. Yes, his father said, glancing at the reporter holding the mic. The son is reassured. The interview is over. Both the father and the reporter realize they are on holy ground. Well, there were plenty of postings following that video debating the firepower of a daisy. Many people pointed out that they'd rather be armed with a cannon than a candle. But the father and son teaching moment spoke to something profound, 
something we yearn for. Nation will not lift up sword against nation. Neither will they learn war anymore. Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. Shall we pray? O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. O come, desire of nations, bind all peoples in one heart and mind. Bid envy, strife, and discord cease. Fill the whole world with heaven's peace. Amen.